So now that you know the difference between chemical and uh, mechanical digestion, we can start to go through all of the different organs in the body in, in order in which a bolus of food would go through. So from ingestion, which means to take it into the body, to egestion, which means it leaves the body. So obviously the first place that food will go uh, would be the mouth. So mouth would be the place where mastication occurs, which is chewing. And the chemical digestion that happens, you could see in your chart before that amylase, which is this protein right here, this enzyme, uh, what it does is it attaches to any type of uh, carbohydrate or starch that comes into the body. So if the food that you're chewing is a starch, the amylase will break it down into maltose. So if you look uh, right here in the slide, you'll notice that uh, this a long chain of glucose molecules is called a starch. So the amylase, this enzyme right here, what it does is it attaches to the starch and it breaks it down into a unit of two glucose molecules put together. And when you have two glucose molecules put together, it's called maltose. So amylase's job is to take the starch and break it down into a smaller unit called maltose. So after mastication and amylase goes to work, the next place that the food goes is down past the epiglottis. So your epiglottis can be seen at the back of your throat, and basically all it does is it prevents food from entering the trachea. You wouldn't want food to enter your trachea because the trachea is a path to your lungs. So you want food to go down your esophagus to your stomach, not down to your lungs. So you can see food right here, it's going down, and this little uh, protrusion of the uh, wall of the esophagus is called the epiglottis. And when you guys did your uh, dissection of the frog, you saw a glottis. So it was a similar contraption. It was more flat. Ours is more of a projection that comes down, and as the food comes down, it kind of hits the epiglottis, pushing the epiglottis down, and the epiglottis folds over top of the entrance to the trachea. That way the food keeps going down the esophagus and doesn't enter the trachea, causing you to cough. So the esophagus uh, is also, it's very stretchy, but it's made of muscle. So a uh, food that wants to go from your mouth down to your stomach is forced down through peristalsis. Peristalsis is the muscular contractions that your muscles undergo in order to get the food down your throat. So if this is your, your esophagus, this is a bolus of food, and the bolus of food is just what we call the food once it's been chewed up into a ball. And it gets uh, the muscles that are right behind the bolus of food, they contract, and that pushes the food down the esophagus. And even if you were upside down, uh, this action, this peristalsis, will still push the food toward your stomach. So in the stomach, peristalsis also occurs because muscles do contract in the stomach, causing the food to churn up. And once the food mixes with the acid here, it's called chyme. So this acid is hydrochloric acid, and it helps with chemical digestion. Uh, there's also something called renin that is created by the cells here, and that coagulates milk. And the reason why that's important is because milk tends to go through our system pretty quickly, and we don't get the chance to absorb the nutrients that we want. So if we can coagulate the milk and make it curdle, almost make it go bad, then it slows down the milk as it goes through our bodies, and we're able to absorb more nutrients from it. So you can see in your frog, and you can also see in this picture here, there's these little folds which make the stomach look wrinkly. Those folds allow the stomach to expand when there's food inside of it. So when the stomach contracts, you get all these little wrinkles called rugae. And the stomach is also lined with mucus because uh, if the stomach is filled with acid, you want to be able to protect the uh, epithelial tissue, the tissue that's surrounding the stomach, you want to be able to protect it from the HCL, the acid. So you have to have a layer of mucus there to protect it. So once food leaves the stomach and goes out the pleuric sphincter, it enters the small intestine, which is broken into three sections. The duodenum is the first section, which comes right off of the stomach, right here. The jejunum is the middle section, and the ileum is the last part of the small intestine. The reason why it's broken into three sections is because there's different functions for each section. So the duodenum, uh, the stomach would be right here, so this would be the opening uh, to the small intestine. This first a uh, curve of the small intestine is where the gallbladder and the pancreas empty into the small intestine. So as food is traveling through here, following my cursor, it doesn't actually go into the pancreas and gallbladder. It just receives the juice from both of those. So the duodenum is responsible for digestion because food does get digested here and broken down. It doesn't absorb any nutrients. 
The jejunum and ileum are surfaced with these little microscopic projections called villi. Now, the microvilli are microscopic, but the villi you can see with the naked eye. So these are just finger-like projections on the surface area of the small intestine, and they allow for nutrient absorption. So without these projections, the inside of the small intestine would be flat, and less surface area would be exposed to absorb nutrients from. The large intestine has a function of basically just compacting the waste uh, and also absorbing water. So you could imagine what would happen if it didn't absorb the water that you wanted to out of your waste products. So that's typically what happens when you have diarrhea. The large intestine isn't absorbing enough water. Or if it's absorbing too much water, then you would have constipation. So it serves as a storage facility before the waste is eliminated, and it also compacts the waste. Now the next organs that we're going to speak about are digestive organs because they do help with digestion. However, the food or the bolus of food doesn't go through these organs, so they're known as accessory organs. And sometimes we say that there's four accessory organs and the salivary glands are considered to be one. Uh, other times we uh, say that there's only three accessory organs and those would be the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. Food doesn't go through these even though they're required for digestion. So the liver has a couple of different jobs. It creates bile. Bile is something that breaks down fat. So that's needed because it needs to digest the fat. It's the second largest organ in the body, second to the skin, and detoxifies material absorbed from the small intestine. So it's important, uh, like alcohol especially, uh, the liver does process it and uh, turn it into a less harmful substance. So after uh, we talk about the liver, there's the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is a green structure here, and the reason why it's green is because it's holding bile. So the bile is manufactured or synthesized in the liver, but then it comes down these ducts, and then it's housed or stored in the gallbladder. So it just stores the bile, and the bile then leaves out the duct and goes into the small intestine to break down fats. You can have your gallbladder removed simply because it stores bile. That's its only function. The pancreas here has a couple of different functions. When we talk about digestion, it basically makes a pancreatic juice, which digests food. Uh, another job of the pancreas is to create insulin. So insulin is important because it has to do with uh, manufacturing sugar. Uh, the pancreas also secretes a sodium bicarbonate solution. And the reason why it does that is because it neutralizes the acid from the stomach. So if you can imagine the food coming from the stomach up here, the food comes down, it's filled with acid because it just left the stomach, and now it's in the duodenum. The duodenum doesn't have as big of a mucus lining as the stomach does, so it's less protected against acid. So you need to neutralize the acid in order for the food to continue to go through the body without harming the body.